315 on that screen. And by 315, it should say 215. I just didn't change my computer clock. You can press play. You're not good at driving this. Oh, sure. What do I do? That. Okay. Hello. Okay, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, we are at DrupalCon Nashville 2018, and you are currently in the session. It's all in the dysfunctional family. If you did not intend to be in the session titled, It's All in the Dysfunctional Family, you can sit awkwardly for the next 24 and a half minutes, or you can gracefully get up now and quietly make your exit. We will not take it personally. We will take it personally. We'll all just avert our heads while you leave. Mm -hmm. So today it's Lee. Myself, David, are presenting this. And I want to begin with a quote from the book that's sort of inspired and gave, gave uh, us the, led us into the experience we had that we're going to relate to you today. And it's by Patrick Lancioni. It's The Five Dysfunctions of Team. I, people here have heard of this book, maybe read it. Nice. It, it, comes, it comes with a companion workbook. And, and if, if if you get a chance, if, the, if this is something you want to be, be trying with your teams, I really recommend getting that companion workbook because while the book itself is interesting and tells a great story. Um, Come on in. We just started. You haven't missed anything. It doesn't tell you how to implement the ideas, uh, and the workbook is what you need to do that. So I'm just going to begin. Not finance, not strategy, not technology. It is teamwork that remains the ultimate competitive advantage, both because it is so powerful and it's so rare. There you, there you go. go. Just a little food for thought as we kick this off. Um, so here's what we're going to be going through today. We're going to do brief introductions of David and myself so you have a sense of where we come from and why we are speaking on this topic. Uh, and then we're going to discuss um, the problem. We're going to use actually a, an example that David himself experienced on a team he uh, was a part of um, to sort of set up a problem and give you an example. And then we'll go through the model that's established in the book to give you a sense of how his team at that time worked through the problems they were facing. Um, the, and we'll relate it back to sort of our experience more broadly. Uh, and then we actually are not going to do the example workshop today because we're not going to have enough time, but we'll give you a couple of uh, tips of things you can try on your own time. And then we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end. Um, so I'll start with the intro. I'm Lee Bryant. I'm the content manager at MyPlanet. MyPlanet is a software studio up in Toronto. We've got people co-located all around the world. Uh, and my experience in terms of team development and teamwork, I've had about 36 jobs in less than 15 years. I averaged more than two a year for a while there. Um, but I've been at MyPlanet for a few years now, and a lot of my jobs were in spaces like um, camp counseling and support work and working with sort of dynamic groups and people who had a lot of really strong personalities or a lot of um, difficulty dealing with other people's emotions and other people's um, individual identities, I guess. <laughs> that was a big part of my early career trajectory was establishing those things, and my career now is focused on content, yes, but a lot of also community building um, and establishing networks and groups of people and bringing people together in sort of trusting relationships. Uh, so that's where I come from on that stuff. And currently, I'm, I'm at my planet as well. I'm a customer success manager there. And previous roles I've had there um, have involved me being a scrum master on a team and a product owner on another team and working with, with my teammates to try to do the best work we could and try to get better at how we get our work done. Uh, and the experience we, I'm going to relate to you, comes out of that motivation uh, on one team in particular. Um, my background originally was in uh, manufacturing, uh, printing, uh, uh, the old printing industry. Uh, back in the early 70s is when I started in that, and here I am, still going, uh, but in the digital world. Um, and uh, I made the move to uh, digital publishing in the early 90s. And through various paths, ended up five years ago joining my planet, and I'm very happy there. Um, but I'd, I'd like to um, bring some of the work I've done focus on, focusing on team building uh, to your attention. So first, I'm going to describe the problem we had. And this may be a problem that, that uh, some of you experience on your teams or see on other teams. And what we were failing to do was to deliver value. And value has a number of meanings, but in this case with a development team, is we weren't delivering the code we were supposed to be delivering, the functionality we were supposed to be delivering on time. And what are the symptoms of this? 
Well, we failed to meet our, our commitments. We were a scrum team, we were running sprints, and we weren't meeting our sprint commitments. We'd make them week in, week out, set ourselves challenges and goals, and we would not make those. Um, what, some of the things slowing our progress, technical debt, defects in our work. Um, and we were doing the this, this scrum practice, the agile practice of retrospectives. Everyone, does everyone here understand what a retrospective is? Don't have to explain that, good. Um, but instead of discussing our problems as a team and, and discussing you know, what we could do to actually meet our commitments, we were discussing things like the amount of light we'd have in our room during the day, where the lights would be on or off, or which set of lights would go, the, uh, what, what, how, how smelly your food could be. We were discussing anything, it's typical bike shedding, right? We were just discussing anything but our actual problems. But these anything seemed like insurmountable problems to us in the discussions. These are symptoms of a problem with a team failing to deliver. So some of the familiar symptoms, and Lee and I are going to go through these, uh, are inattention to details. Uh, the retro is not able to talk, talk about what actually was going on. The defects, those are inattention to details. Uh, inattention during meetings, so a lot of people on their laptops or looking at their phones and scrolling through stuff or taking calls in the middle of meetings, all those kinds of things. I mean, it runs the gamut from just twiddling your thumbs to some truly egregious behavior, but oh, not best. being present yeah. in the actual meeting and listening to what your colleagues are saying is the a pretty good sign. The best was someone falling wrong. asleep in, in, in a team meeting. Um, Who else the, has experienced that out of curiosity? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. It's not uncommon, unfortunately. <laughs> But these are symptoms, and these are things we can, either as observers or as part of a team, go, oh, wait a minute. Um, we also had, people weren't asking for help. We were, we were creating code that had defects in it, but people weren't asking each other for help. There was silence during our meetings. No one asking questions. No one asking questions. No one being willing to risk that level of vulnerability to say, I don't understand, or I'm curious about this, or what if we tried it this way? And, and I've mentioned the defects that, that we kept putting into our code as sprint by sprint. And there are others. Anyone here have a, an example they want to share, pile on, uh, here or not? <laughs> Piling on would be a really <laughs> good example, actually. <laughs> Piling on is another great one. Um, anyway, there are obviously a lot. Anytime your meeting is kind of derailing or your teams are uh, not producing to the degree that you know they should be able to do, there's probably going to be a lot of signs and symptoms of what's going on. So it's a good time for some self-examination. Uh, and in David's case with the team, the realization that they came to was that the solution to the problem actually had to begin with David and a few of the other sort of key uh, core players on the team. So I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, so initially as, as we try, as tried to, the people who were motivated to see the team improve, tried to seek improvement in our retros, we were looking for the wrong things as well. We were trying to focus on, on who was making the mistakes or... Um, non-root causes of the problem, why we weren't working together and collaborating. And, and finally, we just weren't working in a vacuum and trying to solve this. We were, all of us, doing a lot of reading, at least of us in the group, the three of us who were trying to, to get the team moving again. And we stumbled across Patrick Lencioni's book and we realized that, that improvement the team had to start with improvement it, with, with those of us who were in the role of a leader of some sort on the team. And that we had to, had to begin the process by changing ourselves and how we related to the team. And as someone who came from the traditional manufacturing and traditional corporate world, having um, people in a leadership position recognize that they might be the problem was an entirely new concept, one that I'd been aware of when I was in that world, but I'd never actually applied to myself. So um, that's where we started working and looking at ways to work with the team to improve. One more quotation. Do you want to take this one? Mm -hmm. Success comes only for those groups that overcome the all-too-human behavioral tendencies that corrupt teams and breed dysfunctional politics within them. Lots of heavy words to mm -hmm. parse out there. So these are the five dysfunctions of a team. You can see it's something of a pyramid building its way up. It starts with absence of trust which is an unwillingness to be vulnerable within the group. And one of the things that's really highlighted in Lencioni's book is how much you cannot really do anything 
if that core component of trust is missing. If people don't feel safe to speak up and raise a real issue, you're never going to be able to address the issues in a meaningful, absolutely constructive way because they're not even being brought to the fore. Uh, so that absence of trust is a huge, huge, huge cornerstone of how to solve the problems to begin with. Fear of conflict. Um, conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing. Conflict is how we exchange, in this instance, means an exchange of ideas, some of which may not be compatible. Um, there may be two ways to solve a problem or three ways to solve a problem. Which path should we take? That's a conflict that a team has to, has to be able to discuss and resolve. If you don't trust each other, you can't have that discussion because you're not going to open up. You're not going to... Um, have you ever heard someone say after a problem stopped the team and you had to go back, well, I knew that wasn't going to work. Oh, well, why didn't you talk to us about, <laughs> about that in our, in our decision-making process? So without trust, you can't have those conversations around conflicted ideas. Um, and without having that conversation, you can't get to the best resolution to whatever problem you're trying to solve. So the next tier, lack of commitment, um, that one's an interesting one. It's sort of a feigning buy-in for group decisions, which creates some ambiguity, uh, and it creates ambiguity sort of throughout the whole organization. If you don't have the kind of passion and commitment to the situation at hand, and you're just going along with it, sort of to what David was alluding to with that fear of conflict, they're quite closely connected. If you're not willing to speak up and and raise the conflicting opinions, and you'll just go with it because it's easier, then you're not actually trying to find the best solution. You're not actually trying to create the thing that's going to work the best. Uh, and it creates a real structural mismatch, and you're going to end up on a lot of different roads you shouldn't have been on in the first place just because everyone was going with the flow in a really kind of negative way. So the next to last one is uh, avoidance of accountability. Um, and when we're on a team together, and, and um, uh, I'm a, a big fan of, of some other uh, business thought which uh, says that um, motivational rewards should go to the entire team, not be individualized. But there are times when individuals on a team need to take accountability for what they've done. And, and a team where people won't take in accountability for their individual actions is a team that will allow mistakes to, to, to be, be passed through and the defects enter into the code that won't support each other, uh, and that won't step up and take the actions necessary to see the project succeed. And the final one, inattention to results. Uh, so focusing on personal success or status and ego before team success. And this is, I would say, the other thing Lencioni really highlights uh, as one of the key bits. If there's no trust, a lot of what's happening is people are really caught up in their own ego and their own agendas, and they're really feeling that vulnerability anytime they're exposed for having made an error in the code or for having a thought that actually doesn't pan out, an idea that's just not going to come to fruition. Um, so that inattention to results stemming from putting their own ego and their own desire to be the unicorn that's the best in the room and is a 10x dev or whatever it is. I'm not a developer. I probably misused all of those references. Um, that's, that's a real problem creator. That's a really big issue. And so once you've got all those building blocks, you can still find it completely toppling off because people are still so attached to that thing and that they don't care about the end result as long as they look good. That's a really big issue. So remember, teamwork be begins by building trust, and the only way to do that is to overcome our need for invulnerability. And what does invulnerability do for us? Well, if we're invulnerable, we don't need to ask for help. So one, one way that a, uh, a, a team cannot make its sprint target is because people not asking for help spend a day, two days working on a problem, which if they ra had raised the issue with their teammates might have had a solution inside a half an hour or an hour. So that team eventually came to, was able to say to themselves, they got to the point where they could say, hey, look, if you've got a problem, we're going to ask for help with, within two hours of having the problem and not being able to solve it. Previously, the team would, there were members on the team that would go the entire week without asking for help in a problem, and their ticket would never be done. So this sense of vulnerability that you can't make a mistake or you can't be shown to be weak is the thing that stops people from trusting you. And without that trust at that very bottom level, you can't achieve any of the other points along that pyramid. 
So how did we do it? Well, it's hard and it takes time. And, and we had a lot of tentative steps forward that ended up with us starting back at the beginning again. And it comes back to that invulnerability piece and the trust. And back to that previous slide where I mentioned that it was a decision by the three um, people with, a, with, with leadership responsibilities and accountability on the team who got together and realized that we had to start showing the change and be the change ourselves. And when we finally succeeded in doing that, you know, the first time that you show invulnerability to someone, they'll go, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder what that was about. Maybe, you know, it was an interesting lunch or something. So one example of invulnerability to your teammates isn't enough to make this work. You have to do it consistently day in, day out, over a course of a number of weeks. So working with the workbook from, in, in our retros, from um, the five dysfunctions, it probably took us six to eight weeks to get to the point where we could actually feel that that trust was starting to happen with everyone, that we stopped protecting ourselves from each other. And that allowed us to move on to accountability, not sorry, what's the next one after accountability after? Um, after trust? Yeah, I'm, sorry? I, I just turned 65, I have fair some problems, conflict. fair compact. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's when we could start having uh, conversations that, that were passionate about what our solutions could be to a particular story, but, but also had conflict in them, without the, the, the conversation breaking down into, well, I don't think you, you know what you're talking about, or, well, I told you so. So once we crack those two bottom pieces, everything else seemed like a snap, because those two bottom pieces are the ones that allow the other three to actually occur. Because the other three can't happen with, without trust and without the ability to have passionate discussion with opposing ideas. The results. The results. It was a team that excelled. David's team turned around, I think, like you said, it took six or eight weeks for them to get from that really um, kind of horrifying <laughs> state of super inefficiency, frankly, they were really underperforming, uh, to a team that was phenomenal, producing beyond expectations several weeks out of the many that followed those first six to eight, uh, which is a huge deal. They went from missing deadlines, from not being able to make commitments, from being hugely, hugely, hugely in technical debt and increasingly kind of budgetary debt a little bit, uh, to meeting and surpassing the goals and overcoming it entirely, which is obviously very, very important, especially that budget stuff from a business perspective. But more importantly, the team was just functioning. They were getting along. They were helping each other. They were improving individually and as a group. Those are all really, really important things. And one of the kind of best benefits that came out of it was that the team itself had some new innovations that came out of it that they were able to then proactively bring to the client and offer up new opportunities that otherwise... I mean, not only would, would they never have surfaced those opportunities, they were going to miss the ones that were already present and we were going to lose a lot of stuff. So they went from not being able to meet current expectations to exceeding them and getting new expectations put on them that they were also able to meet. Yeah, I just wanted to talk to that at that point. And, and, and it's in hindsight I recognize the great job our product owner was doing because the, the client wasn't happy with some of our delivery, a lot of our delivery, but he managed to maintain a good relationship with the client that when the team changed and did begin to deliver, the client's trust in us also grew. So it's not just internal trust you can garner by being following this sort of process, it's external trust that you will gain as well. And we got so much trust with the client that we, we were eight weeks into a project for them and one of our team members in a, in, in a team meeting said, you know what, I don't think this, this solution that we've jumped on at the beginning is actually the best solution, and it's actually going to scale to do what the client needs. And we went back, our product owner went back to the client and said, we've got another idea. Uh, will you pay us to uh, work for two weeks on this other idea to do a prototype? And they said yes, and the prototype worked. And then we said, will you allow us to throw out these eight weeks of work and tack another eight weeks on to the end of the project and we're going to do it this new way. And they went, yes. From the business point of view, those opportunities and those innovations never would have happened if the team not, had not have improved their collaboration, 
improved their trust, and gone through that, that hard work they did um, going through the uh, five dysfunctions workbook. And it, it showed a result on our bottom line, and it showed a result in a, in a, uh, a solution architecture that we were able to leverage onto several other projects as well. So as David just said, hard one trust in each other resulted in deep trust from the client. Um, so if this were a longer session, right now is where we would do this sample trust exercise, but instead we'll just quickly talk through it because we want to leave a little bit of time for questions and we're starting to get down to that point. We are. Um, so a sample trust exercise, one of those sort of quick, easy wins you can do a short workshop is to divide the group into smaller groups, or if you've only got, say, a team of five or six, that's probably small enough. <laughs> you wouldn't want to go much beyond five or six people. I think that's probably the upper limit, David. You agree? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you want to explain three things. Where you grew up, how many kids were in your family, and what was the most difficult or important challenge of your childhood? Not your inner childhood, not like a hugely traumatic, horrifying, revelatory incident, but something that's a little bit personal, something that says a little bit about how you came to be the person you are. Um, just kind of the most important challenge of being a kid. And the most important challenge of being a kid, keep in mind, is often like, I was always, I'm the youngest, and so I got the smallest portion at dinner. And that's like, fine, you, you're probably fine, but it probably informs a little bit how you feel about trusting other people to give you your fair share of things and how you feel ownership over things and that kind of stuff. So, and you can change out these questions and adapt them as necessary, but an exercise that just gets three really quick, reasonably straightforward pieces of information out into the group, shared among the group, is a great starting point yeah. in terms of exercises. And if, and if I can give you a tip about this, it's we're, we're not Dr. Freud. Uh, we're, we're not psychoanalyzing each other. Thank God. And try not to get into the negative things. Tr try to, to, to frame the questions and the discussions around the good things that happen, happen in people's lives. Those things can still uh, inform us and provide us with insights into each other, but it means someone isn't being, doesn't have the feeling, particularly at the early stage when they may not have the trust in the process yet, the feeling of being arm twisted into revealing things that they wouldn't reveal to, to people normally. So you get people to reveal things that they would tell over a, a drink in a pub or, or something like that. Uh, what was their proudest moment in high school or what was the name of their grade school teacher and, and talk about that. But don't talk about, you know, how many times did you get strapped when you were in, in kindergarten? No sort of thing. You don't want to go there. That is very grim. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying this talk, everyone. <laughs> I was, wait I was waiting for the other student to I drop, David. Examples, yeah. Right? Um, so that is it in terms of what we've got prepared for you. But if you've got questions, now is the ideal time to bring them up. Anybody have any questions? Come on up to the mic. Yeah, please. I was wondering about uh, if you could give a specific example of like a conversation someone on, in leadership or on your team would, would you know, being vulnerable, like what, what that would look like. Yeah, absolutely. So the question, I don't know if that mic is recorded, so I'm just going to repeat it, was could we provide an example of someone in the leadership position sort of role modeling or giving an example of their own vulnerability in order to sort of prompt it with the group? Um, I mean, even just in that last workshop example, being the first one to share what that challenge was is a great first step towards that. Or being willing to say, you know, last week, I uh, had a client meeting and I said this one thing, I promised we could deliver on it and I hadn't actually checked with our technical leadership team and I spoke out of turn, we weren't gonna be, I messed up, I made that mistake, I oversold our capacity. Owning that mistake is a really great and example well, of your own vulnerability. One of, the, one of the other members of the leadership group of that team is in the room and we, we would often, without setting it up too much, would work together so I would admit a mistake that I would made had made, and and his response would be to accept that, to make a suggestion to prevent that from happening in the future. But I would not be scolded or reprimanded. So people got the idea that oh, it's okay to admit to a mistake. You're not going to be in trouble because you admit to making a mistake. So we often would would it wasn't role playing because he's an actual mistake I'd made. But we would make sure <laughs> that. that <laughs> that the conversation happened where it could be heard by other people so that we could expose my vulnerability and we could also expose that inside the team, as long as you were working towards improvement, that being 
being able to say you made a mistake and identify it and identify corrective action kind of got almost rewarded um, yeah. without, without there being a cooking involved. But there, there was a way that you, there, there was nothing bad happening because mm -hmm. of this sequence of events. And if you don't have that sort of natural partner in crime to bounce that off of, then you can facilitate it yourself. I made this mistake. Can anyone give me, I would love if you've got an idea of how I could have avoided that in the future. Ask for that help. That's a great, asking for help, honestly, everyone in this room forever, regardless of what you're doing, just ask for help. People want to give help. They feel so good when you give them the chance to help. You seem like so much less of a little tight hummingbird that is so fraught. It's just the greatest thing. You feel good when you get the help. Everything about it is great. My number one recommendation to all people. Question, sorry, before I go off on a help tangent. Hi, um, this, this is recorded, in fact. Oh, great, fantastic. But, um, I will not repeat it. Um, so, so I'm going to start by just asking, in, in your example, David, um, you, the, you had your three leaders who kind of banded mm -hmm. together to... to begin the sort of you know introspection and improvement process and i'm going to just start by asking like i know i know your role but what what were the roles of the three and and the second part of the question is how did how did the three of you kick this off how, how did how did uh, what was it like to talk to each other and begin that conversation and saying this is rotten what can we do to lead the team uh to improvement um so i was the, it was a scrum team i was the scrum master we had a tech lead on the team and we had a product owner on the team and we were the three that put our heads together and had been looking for ways, to, particularly the tech lead and myself, who had been looking for ways to get this team out of the rut it was in. And we were really good on the scrum ritual, so we were having our regular retrospectives, they just were pretty ineffective. And we just brought it up in a retrospective and said, look, we've come across this book, here it is, and we shared some stuff from it. And what do you think about giving this a try? Because there were developers, some of the, many of the developers on the team wanted to see this problem solved, but they didn't have the tool, tools to solve it. And so this workbook gave us a way to put ourselves on a railroad track, so to speak, and find, find a solution because it was a known method for finding a solution. And particularly with devs, I mean, what better way to frame a, a, a solution to a human problem but, but to say, look, we've found this path that isn't too, you know, funny and it's kind of engineery like. Um, let's give it a try. And we got buy in. It took, it still took a lot of time for that initial first rung to be crossed. I'm going to cut us off now because yeah, uh, there's another group in here afterwards. But if there are more questions, we'll be just outside. And thank you so much. And feel free to send your information, take the survey, etc., and join the sprints or whatever that other slide was that we're supposed to big up and I forgot to do. And have a great rest of DrupalCon, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good job, you guys. Thank you. Sorry for running a little long there.